Tonight we go to the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel to chapter 6. And there we will find words that I am certain will fall well within our theme when God steps in. I begin with verse 16. So the king gave the order. And they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him. And the king could not sleep. Let's bow together as we pray. Father in heaven, tonight we come again wanting to see the power that is yours when you choose to step in. Our hearts are open tonight. For these are times that need the presence of God. Certainly a nation needs God and certainly neighborhoods need God. But tonight our focus is for our own lives. We need God to step into our own hearts. Now as we go through these words tonight that are sacred, we pray that our hearts might be lifted and that our minds might be enlightened. In the name of Jesus, amen. The situation is one that most of us are fairly sure we know. Daniel is a holdover from another kingdom. He is a holdover from Babylonia. And you would suspect that uh, when the time comes for the Medes and the Persians to put together their alliance, that most of the talent pool would be expected to come from within. In fact, try if you can not to put the Bible outside of normal range. There are the same human elements in this book that exist right now. Can you imagine if one nation had ruled and now another comes to the stage that most of the people who had supported the government who had supported those who had come into power would expect that when positions were filled those positions would be filled by the ones who gave support can you imagine the dismay when somebody suggests that this man held over from another time another period another power structure is going to be brought in now to fill a very high position Think, if you will, that everybody was happy. But I can tell you this. You may get smiles and warm handshakes from people when you are promoted, but everybody is never happy when you're the one and they are not. <laughs> so in the hallways, you know, I want to say there was a water fountain. You know there wasn't, but you understand, don't you? When they gathered around to talk, somebody probably brought it up. It was a ticklish subject, but someone had to say it. And why is Daniel that old has-been? <laughs> why again? Hasn't he seen his time? You know, the young people want to say, get the old folk out of the way and move on. And then there are some nationalists who must have been around. How dare we bring someone whose customs are different? Why, we don't even know what these people are like. And yet, we bring this man and put him high on the list. I read that uh, the country, the nation, was divided into what they call satrapies. And these satraps were people called to keep order, to make sure that there was no anarchy, but most importantly, to make sure that the revenue flowed smoothly. All governments run on revenue. 
And they wanted to make sure that there were, there were no social uprisings, that nobody withheld taxes. So they said everything as quietly and as calmly as they could. But now a moment comes when not only will this Daniel be listed among those who are high in government, but they are considering him to be the first among the princess. Ah, that's a different story. You know, we, we'll be open-minded enough to have him part, but how dare you put him over me? Someone must have made an impassioned plea to Darius. How could you do it? I feel stabbed in the back. Where was Daniel when you were trying to consolidate power? Where were these people? How dare you? But the Bible is clear that Daniel had an excellent spirit. You know, it's kind of hard to find people with an excellent spirit anymore. I, I think that if God is in your heart, if you have dedicated yourself to serve the Almighty, there certainly ought to be some way to prove it. I heard one preacher say, uh, you ought to ask the question, if you are accused of being a Christian, would there be enough information, would there be enough evidence to indict you? If people followed you from day to day, you know how they do, gathering evidence, would it be possible for someone to prove by looking at the way you conduct your life that you serve a God who is invisible? Well, when you looked at Daniel, you could tell there was something different about him. In fact, one writer says that not only was this Daniel a man with an excellent spirit, but you could find no flaws in the way that he conducted business. Ah, now that's quite different. There are people who are able to separate their religion from normal life. In fact, you've heard people say it. <laughs> if you keep on with me, I'm going to put my religion down. You know, portable religion isn't of much value at all, is it? <laughs> if you put it down, what in the world are you doing with it? But Daniel obviously did not only allow his love for God and his quest for excellence to be a part of his religious life, his worship, but he let it bleed over into everything that he did. So that when he was the one in charge of a project, you could assume that all of the dots would be over the I's and all the T's would be crossed because that's the kind of administrator he was. So when they began to talk about putting him up, uh, people could make all kinds of snide remarks and they could level all kinds of criticisms, but the one thing they couldn't say and the one thing you don't read is, he's not qualified. <laughs> it's amazing. When people can't find that you're not qualified, they look elsewhere. But I would like to think, <laughs> in fact, I, I, I want to believe that at some point in my life, I could rise to the point where the only thing that my enemies could say about me is that I'm faithful to my God. Here was a man, and, and believe me, if they could have gone back through his dossier, don't think that somebody wasn't left over from Babylonia, some sore head left over from Babylonia who said, you talk to me, I know him. Said, well, let's talk. Let's do lunch, you know. So they go now to do a power lunch. And the object of their conversation is, tell me about this, Daniel. What's the scoop on Daniel? Oh, I can tell you about it. Well, what is it? We, the man has got to have some flaw. Everybody's got some problem. What is it? Well, if this man were wise, he would go all the way through the lunch before he came to the bottom line because he would hope they picked up the check before they discovered he had nothing to say. There was nothing to dig up on Daniel. In fact, if all of the people who had asked him to serve were brought together, the only accusation that they could level was he's true to his God. So, so when they looked at the records, when they searched the dossier, when they looked at the historical record, and when they wanted to know what kind of reputation does he have, nobody could come up with anything on him. I wouldn't dare 
turn that around to us in this room. Because then everyone would get nervous. <laughs> because for most of us, that just can't be said. But here's a man who serves his God so well that he is meticulous in the way that he does his job. I think it's the way that it ought to be. If you claim to be like Christ, you ought to be like Christ all the time. Even in the job that you do. So now, what will you do if you want to stop a person from being placed in an office, but you can find no place to put blame on them? Well, you know, all you've got to do is get creative. So you mean you have evaluated everything, and what do they say? Well, we had the power lunch with the guy from Babylonia. All he could come up with was the man worships his God. Is that so? Well, what do you know about it? Well, we've checked with everyone, and all of the witnesses speak with one voice. The only thing that they can find out different about him is that he believes in this God. It's different than the way that we worship, but he certainly will not change his pattern for anyone. Well, I wonder, my quandary is, how could we turn this very faithfulness against it? Some evil mind begins to turn in the back of a room. Well, suppose, let me just speak theoretically. <laughs> suppose it could be arranged so that his fidelity to his God could become a liability rather than an asset. Well, how do you do that? What do they say he does with his God? Well, as we understand it, at the third, the sixth, and the ninth hour, he leaves his place of work and goes home. Uh, in those days, they claimed that Mesopotamian houses uh, would often have one room elevated from the rest of the flat-roofed house, and this probably was the prayer room. So that in Daniel's situation, he would go into the elevated room, if there were such, he would turn towards the direction of Jerusalem and open the window. Now, you know that when you pray, you don't have to open a window. That it was not obviously for the sake of God, for God hears prayers through closed windows. God hears prayers in any situation. You can be at the bottom of the water in a great fish. God will hear the prayer, but Daniel was so dedicated and so intentional in his worship of his God that he didn't want anybody to have any doubts about who he was. I praise God for people like this because there are so many folks today who you can't tell what they're about. You know, the chameleon people. They are whatever you are. As soon as they find out who you are, well, yes, I, I quite agree. And when you leave, they agree with the next person and the next person. Their whole lives are spent adjusting to the ambiance in the room. There ought to be somebody who believes in something. Daniel was defiant in his decision. He would worship the God of heaven, and he wanted people to know that there was a difference in him. And so he went and opened the window towards Jerusalem, and there he prayed. And they said, this is what we've discovered, that he will leave the office. And he, well, said, you know, maybe there's something in that. There, perhaps we can make something of it. His customs are different. What else did you find? Well, we've discovered that there are some differences in the way that he dresses. His diet is not quite like ours. Uh, this man has customs that don't blend. He's, he's, he doesn't fit in. He's not a team player. If we could get this maniacal obsession of his about this God away, he might even fit in, but he won't. I said, well then, why don't we use that against him? Well, come on, how can you use that against him? Sounds to me like a good thing. Well, suppose, just, just suppose. 
Suppose our king were to say that no one can pray to anyone except him for 30 days. <laughs> well, that's absurd. Why would the king ever say that? Well, I wasn't thinking that the king would say it on his own. I was thinking that perhaps someone could uh, maybe incline him to take a position like that. And if we, we stroked him in the correct way, you know the king does have a fairly healthy ego. Perhaps we could cajole him. Perhaps he could see light in being worshipped for 30 days. Now, let me show you what I missed for the longest about this. What they will try to get the king to say and finally be successful at is to say that you cannot pray to any god or any man for 30 days except the king. Essentially, stopping all prayer for a month. Do you know what kind of shape the world is in with prayer? It is mind-boggling to think that you would stop prayer for a month. I don't know about you, but there have been some times in my life when, for whatever reason, I have allowed my prayer life to, to have gaps. And I've discovered that when I don't pray, my life is different. Prayer is, is the breath that I breathe. It is the connection with God. How can you make it without prayer? There are problems that you can face with prayer. Even though God may not determine to take the problem away, God will give you the strength to stand up under the pressure if you pray. But how in the world would you make it without prayer? For a month, how could you make it a day without prayer? This maniacal obsession that they cite now makes them move in a way that does not make sense at all. Well, allow me now. I have not been able to read anything or find anything on this, but I have prayed that God will baptize my imagination. Allow me, if you will, to guess at what it might have been like when these men go in to talk to the king. Oh, King Darius. The majesty of your presence, sir. Forgive us, but in your presence we are hesitant to even speak. Why, just before we came in, we were saying, weren't we, how blessed we are. No one anywhere, no nation on the face of the earth can boast a man with such wisdom, with such insight. And beyond that, if you would allow us to say, a man whose countenance is so fair to look upon. Forgive us, Your Honor. Your Highness, we know that you are not a man who likes this kind of thing, but sometimes our hearts bubble over. Please understand. Now, we have brought you. <laughs> We have brought you an idea. We were trying to think of some way that we could let it be known far and wide that you are far and above any other potentate. Could we, sir, don't speak too quickly, don't turn us away out of hand. Could we, sir, for, for just the period of a month, pray only to you and to no one else? Think about it. Many a person has been caught in a situation just like this. There are some men who allow women. <laughs> to tell them things that they know are not true. I thank God for mirrors, don't you? Before you leave home, you are able to look at yourself and remind yourself what you look like. 
Brother, when a woman comes up to you and says, oh, huh, you are so muscular. And you know the last time you pumped iron, you were in your teens. And now most of your muscularity has given way to gravity. And yet you will allow some woman to tell you things that you know are not true. And in the, the warmth, the basking of the moment, do something or say something or commit to something that does not make sense. And ladies, you enjoyed that, but you know <laughs> those sweet nothings. Oh, I look at you. And you know, you just check the mirror, folks. Check the mirror. You can be safe. Look, just look. Oh, your eyes. You know, you've seen your eyes all of your life. Oh, they just dance with lights. Now you're about to do something very foolish. There are people who get into all kinds of trouble because somebody says the right words in the right way. They may be so far from the truth that it's ridiculous. But here is a king about to do something silly. Well, I, uh, I really should think on it. But, Your Highness, it's something that you need to do. Let's grasp the moment. Our hearts bubble over. Allow us, please. Just if you would have fixed your, your signet here. We'll take care of all of the, the details. We, we could have it done, sir, before the day's over. And all of the people would rise up as one and praise us for this gesture that we're about to give you. Would you, sir, just give it to me, sir. Let me do it. The wax, someone. And just let's have it done. We have it here. We've prepared it. It's all done. Would you like to read it, or would you trust us? <laughs> and now it's done. Now, don't think that Daniel is so naive that he doesn't know. If you're going to be in government, You've got to have an information system. Huh? Forgive me, this is, this is not strictly biblical, but it does make sense. You've got to be aware of what's going on. This move by the king reverberates all over now, and the word is out. The king has signed a document that says you cannot pray to any god or any man for 30 days. And Daniel, in his heart, has to decide what? Will I do? Will I? You know how we rationalize God. Well, God would certainly want me to keep this position. Um, after all, I am here representing him. And if I pray openly, I will lose the position. So in the long run, it would really serve God's purposes more for me to stay than to be put out. So what would it hurt for 30 days if I were to simply pray quietly in the office. How many times have you done that in your own heart? <laughs> well, I, I know what's right, but God wouldn't want me to, to, to really misrepresent him. But Daniel does not make that decision, knowing full well that they're watching. In fact, maybe because they're watching. When the third hour from sunrise, let's suppose it's around nine, they're watching now. Let's see what he does. <laughs> see what strong man Daniel's going to do now. And he leaves his office, goes home. I said, well, are the people following? Oh, yeah, we follow. We got them on him. They're watching. <laughs> see if the window's open now. You don't think he's going to do that, do you? Well, the window's open. You see him? There he is. Oh, this is going to be easy. <laughs> there he is, pray. Well, okay. You know, he's, he's going to make this, he's going to fall into the trap. And at the, at the sixth hour and at the ninth hour, he's there. And they observe him and they take down the notes and they make sure that it's all documented. They have established a paper trail. You know, when you go to the king, you can't go empty-handed. 
So someone has it there. So they've got to get, okay, do you have everything listed? Let's not just do it one day. Let's, let's watch him a little longer. We don't have exactly the time, but, but let's watch him. Daniel is there exactly on time. He does not change anything. When he prays, he opens the window and prays towards Jerusalem. And his prayer is open and above board. I suggest to you that when you lose your sensibility and when you make a silly decision, you will discover that people's attitudes change. As long as you hold to what's right. They may not like you, but they respect you. Have you ever wondered if your life really mattered to God? What plans he has for you or how the Bible is relative to your life? Our offer this week is the Discover Bible Guides, guiding you to new horizons on your spiritual journey. Each guide is beautifully written and illustrated for you to discover for yourself how God answers our most seeking questions about life. Just call our toll-free number, 877-BOL-OFFER, and ask for the Discover Bible Guides. That's 877-265-6333. We are now making the Discover Bible Guides available to you for free. Or you may write and ask for the Discover Bible Guides. Just write to Breath of Life, P.O. Box 97192, Washington, D.C., 20077. Get your set of the Discover Bible Guides today and discover the answers to life's biggest questions. Let's just praise the Lord. If you'd like an audio cassette copy of today's program, call the number on your screen or write Walter Pearson, P.O. Box 97192, Washington, D.C., 20077. For your love gift of any amount, we'll send out your copy right away. And if you have a special prayer request, write us. Walter Pearson wants this ministry to be a blessing in your life. Walter Pearson believes that Jesus Christ is the answer to every problem you face. 